Greetings friends, welcome to this edition of Art and Coffee, the video series dedicated to helping you find and forge your own unique voice in the realms of art and visual storytelling. As always, I am yours truly, Mr. Gabe Dunstan. Good to see you again, glad you're here. Today's coffee is the Chiapas, Chiapas, uh, they're Arabica beans. It's, it's, alright, it's spelled C-H-I-A-P-A-S. Uh, Arabica beans grown in Mexico by the Oak City Coffee Roasters. Balanced sweetness, citric, toffee, chocolate with soft herbal aftertaste. Uh, well, I did not get the herbal aftertaste. This is a pretty good coffee. The last coffee that I had from, from uh, Oak City Roasters, as you might recall, gave me some pretty severe acid. This one is, yeah, it's much, much lighter in the acid territory. So, yeah, I recommend it. Give it a shot. Today's episode is one of the secret weapons in terms of how to get better at art, but the secret weapon comes with a catch. It's kind of your magic bullet to really, really uh, accelerate your, your growth as an artist, but only if you use it right. This technique comes with a couple of dangers, so I'm going to walk you through it. We're going to talk about it, and, uh, and hopefully this is as useful to you as the information has been to me, so let's get on it. The secret weapon is is a very very old weapon. It is the way that painters used to be uh, taught back in the art schools, and I mean back back in the art schools, as in starting in the late Renaissance and all the way through the uh, early 20th century. And the method was, if you want to be a painter, okay, here's what you do: you gather up the paintings of the masters, which the high lords of art would decide who the masters were, and they would say, all right, here are the master works copy them. And in the process of copying them, you would uh, learn how they were painted, you would learn some new techniques, you would might learn, uh, you, would, you were theoretically learning through osmosis how the masters did it, and, and it, was, it was like uh, your, own little, your own little college or master's course in making art by studying from the masters. And it was more complicated than that, but it was also a strange ramshackle way to teach. And then uh, the Impressionists of the uh, late 19th, early 20th century started to, to throw that off as, as some sort of... That was what, what made them radical in their day. What made them the punk rockers of painting was, one, they made paintings that gave you the impression of what you were seeing, but were not, not entirely accurate, were much more stylized, like, uh, like Monet... He's just, he's not trying to paint the thing he sees, he's trying to paint the light reflecting off the thing he sees. Which, if you want to be technical, is all you're doing in the first place, but let's let's not go down that rabbit hole. Uh, and the finished project looked more or less like half-finished paintings, and so like, uh, uh, you know, the punk rockers of old, of the late 70s and early 80s, that's what they do. I know exactly four chords, I can't sing, but I can scream really loud, and here's what I'm gonna do. BAM! And just like punk rock, it took a minute, but then it caught on and it caught on in a great big way. And there's your Impressionist painting. So the idea of master studies as 100% necessary orthodoxy to become a decent artist fell by the wayside. And then, not only did it fall by the wayside, but a lot of artists just rejected it outright. And by reject, I mean threw it away like, uh, uh, threw it away as the new heresy. The old heresy is what the Impressionists did. What you were supposed to do is you start by sketching, you start by drawing. You draw from master sketches, and then from after drawing, then you learn to paint, but you learn to paint with just a few colors at a time. You use one, maybe two brushes, and then you add and add and add. Meanwhile, the Impressionist school was like, oh, you want to paint? Here's a canvas, here's some paints, here's some brushes, go. If you want to paint, then you need to paint, and here, do it. Uh, and and so as so many times as so many things happen in in uh cultures and histories across the world uh the new heresy which was the impressionist style uh screw the master studies became the new orthodoxy and the old orthodoxy which was take your time learn bit by bit study the masters became the new heresy so now you've got art teachers and art schools who are using both of these methods as way to 
ways to uh, preach the, the gospel of art as they see it, and also to abdicate themselves responsibility. So you get the old, old school art school teachers who would say, all right, you are going to just, it's just you and your pencil and you're going to sketch and you're going to sketch very simple still lives and then you'll take the next step to more complex still lives and then after a while you'll start sketching figures, sketch, 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 all pencils and then paint with just a few colors and it's because that's what they were taught and there's very clear steps and so there's not a whole lot of thinking or a whole lot of teaching that has to take place, just take steps and that's the orthodoxy and that's the way it's done and on the other hand you've got these art teachers who uh no you you throw yourself into it you you paint you paint now and whatever you come up with is marvelous and that's another way to to kind of get responsibility off of you because uh, i i'm here to teach you painting and look you're painting so i must be teaching right and uh, so these are both examples of either orthodoxy kind of doing it wrong. Now what I was brought up with, I was brought up with the step by step. First you draw the simple still life and then the more difficult still life and then you do gestural drawings of figure drawing, which gestural drawings is uh, very painterly and not very cartoony or comic-y, which th those are where I live. It trains you to see the figure as an amorphous series of forms leading into each other in a certain kind of rhythm, as opposed to the the more draftsman method, which is the where where the cartoonist tradition comes from, where it's like, no, you you see the skeleton, there's the head, there's the spine, you know, build a skeleton and make a figure that does a thing, because figures are mechanical objects that do something, and so you need to learn how to make figures do things. And then the painterly orthodoxy is like, no, figures are, it's, it's, it's the form that's beautiful. Whereas the cartoons are like, the form has a function, you need to understand the function, and around and around it goes. So I was brought up with the painterly method, which is very, eh, it wasn't good. But this painterly method came with it step by step. First you sketch, then you sketch, then you sketch, and then you paint a little bit, and then you paint a little bit. And it never brought up master studies, ever. And in fact, the idea of a master study, the idea of copying somebody else's art, that's childish. That's for kids doodling in notebooks. Do you want to be a serious artist or not? Well, serious artists draw from life and that's it. That's all you do. And that stuck with me really hard. So as I got older, as an artist, uh, that's what I did. I drew for, I put my the comics and the cartoons that I loved so much, when it came time to draw, I put them away. And I would draw from photographs as much as possible or do life drawing. Now I hasten to add, that's a good thing to do. Photographs and life drawing, that's where it's at. Because there are severe dangers, especially as a cartoonist, severe dangers of copying other people's cartooning. But there's there's a great deal of benefit to be had if you do it right and it's taken me this long to rediscover and figure that out and I want to share it with you and I want to share the dangers with you so so here we go let's get started in earnest step by step if you could please put your pencil down just one second put your eyes on the screen I want to show you something this is what I'm working with today these are the master works that I've accumulated to work from uh, and these are all masterwork examples of what is called Cartoon Modern, which is the style that I want to learn as much about as I possibly can. What you've got are examples from, on top, the examples from the Powerpuff Girls, namely extras that you would see in the background. People like character designers had to just go, boop, there you go. Followed by uh, some more specifics from the early, when Cartoon Modern was first invented and started becoming more codified as an art style as opposed to a utilitarian thing. And uh, including a brief shot from the original movie, uh, 101 Dalmatians, and shots of, uh, I forget her name, but the, uh, the teenage girl from Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. I think there's, I always suspected that there's some kind of genius to her character design, and I wanted to, I wanted to learn more. And the way to learn more as an artist is to do. If you want to learn more about writing, you read a lot. You read a lot. You write a lot, but you read a lot. You want to learn more about art? You just have to do the art. And copying other art in master studies, that is how artists read. That is what's happening here. Artists 
read other artists by copying because then we have to make our brains and our hands and all of our cognitive connections recreate the shapes and the contrasts and the uh, what was that? the compositions of the master work and it, it forces you to understand the master work far deeper than just looking at it looking at it that's great it's super important by all means uh, if comics and animation is what you're into read a lot of comics watch a lot of animation but these master studies will help take it even further when used properly, here's a short list of some things that master studies will help you do. Uh, one, it'll help you to study the art forms that you like, understand their strengths and weaknesses of that art form in ways that you would not understand just by looking at it. For example, Cartoon Modern was first invented as a style because animation, the, the cost per hour of work went way down. Budgets for animation fell through the floor during the late 50s and all through the 60s. So animators had to come up with a design style that would cut their time in half, but was still compelling and expressive. So here we go. And understanding the, the deep, intimate ins and outs of how to make it happen, that's what I'm after in this study right here. The other thing is it helps you to understand the master's art process. Kind of get as close as you can to getting inside of their head, understanding what they were after, why they were after it. Maybe uh, you learn what their favorite shapes were, their favorite ways to manipulate shapes. You learn their vocabulary. The people who did constant master studies of Jack Kirby found out one of the reasons the man was so fast is because he had four or five stock faces. He didn't make very expressive faces, he didn't spend a lot of time there. All of his face time was spent just making them recognizable. He also had something in the neighborhood of seven to ten stock hand positions that he would use over and over again, which made him much faster. And that's something that artists wouldn't discover as quickly or as effectively without sitting down and doing the studies, without pulling out their pencil and, and copying to see what's going on. In addition to learning the vocabulary of another artist, you also build on the vocabulary you have. The quickest, most effective way to build your actual verbal vocabulary is by reading a lot, particularly reading out loud and hearing how words are pronounced and how they're used in a sentence. Nothing builds your vocabulary faster than just reading a lot because you'll you'll take in words from other people and it makes your own words and vocabulary of your own writing so much more rich. Same thing happens in art. There is a visual vocabulary. Look how straight one end of that saxophone is, but the other end is, is bowed, it's belled a little bit. Uh, that's a part of the vocabulary of this artist that I'm learning and I'm trying it on and seeing if I enjoy it, seeing if I find it as compelling as he did to draw it. Which, eh, well, gotta say, I don't know, I like my round ends to be round. He said, sincerely talking about art and with no double meaning intended. Next, uh, one of the last things that I could think of, uh, and one of the number one reasons why I do Master Studies and I keep a library of various comics and art books, is because drawing art is problem solving. You have a very specific problem to solve. You need to represent three-dimensional objects with two-dimensional marks on a paper or canvas or tablet as whatever your case may be but that's a pretty severe problem which most all visual art is trying to solve visual art outside of sculpture uh, three-dimensional objects represented on a two-dimensional medium super tough that is a problem to solve and every artist solves it differently there's lots and lots of commonalities but so many differences so for instance a tree a tree is an extremely difficult thing to draw because there are so many trees and there's so many variations and there's so many textures and there's so many little branches and twigs and there's so many leaves and you can't draw them all individually so how do you represent a tree effectively but also efficiently do you want to spend all day drawing a tree which if you do that's that's up to you but man you still got to choose how much detail and where it goes or do you want to spend as little time as possible but not make it look rushed and terrible well how do you figure out how to do that look at a tree and then look at somebody's cartoon drawing of a tree because by looking at the real thing and comparing it to the drawing of the thing by the master that you're attempting to study then that's that's how you can reverse engineer how did they solve this problem how did they do it with their line with their texture with their line weights with their spot blacks all that stuff and just as a personal as a personal little little uh, suggestion um jeff smith uh, of bone fame 
Uh, look him up. He he does trees real good. Also, David Peterson of Mouse Guard fame. Tons and tons of nature in Mouse Guard. Uh, and he's he's he uses his pen very very detailed renderings of nature. So there you go, you get this very traditional animate like this traditional animation guy uh, in Jeff Smith who went on to comics, and then you get this other very traditional nature renderings with pen and ink from this other guy David Peterson. Great ways to compare about uh, drawings from nature in cartoon form. But let's talk about something else. Master studies, why they're discouraged by so many art teachers, particularly every single one I ever had. There's a lot of legitimate dangers in losing yourself in master studies. For instance, if you spend all your time copying other people's drawings, you're not actually developing your own voice. You're just copying. And you turn yourself into a person who can only copy, and that's not good. Uh, it's similar to fan fiction. Playing in somebody else's world is a great way to learn, but if that's all you can do, then you'll never end up telling your own stories. Just a version of somebody else's. And man, that is not good. Especially not if you're a writer. Especially not if you are trying to find your own voice. Find and forge your own voice. And the best that you could possibly do is just end up aping somebody's style, and the best you could do aping somebody else's style is become a poor copy of that person. Which, a lot of poor copies of other artists were hired in the 90s, and that's kind of one of the reasons why the 90s comic book business fared very well and then very, very poorly. Jojo Mayer, one of my favorite drummers, and perhaps one of the most creative drummers that I know of, had a favorite drummer named Tony Williams, who to this day is his favorite drummer of all time, the jazz drummer, Tony Williams. And he said that at some point he went on a moratorium and refused to listen to Tony Williams at all for a minimum of 10 years because he loved him so much that if he kept listening and if he kept only taking in the Tony Williams vocabulary into his, his musical diet, then he would end up, unwittingly or not, a Tony Williams clone. And there's already so many orthodoxical jazz drummers out there. There's enough clones of Tony Williams already, but there's only one JoJo Mayer. But in order to become a name in drumming, in order to become a name in being creative and having his own style, he had to force himself away from the music that he loved in order to explore new musical avenues and explore a different musical diet. Uh, another reason why this is dangerous is because even the masters that you love, they had bad habits and you might be learning their bad habits and you might be internalizing their bad habits. Something I see this in a lot is the kids who just love anime and they love manga and so they copy every facet of it. Not understanding that the artists were making utilitarian choices in one place, for instance the speech bubbles that go up and down instead of left and right. And understanding that the time and money constraints on Japanese animators and manga creators are very strict and very tough. Those guys literally work themselves into early graves, and I mean that literally, they, they, these people don't often die old. They cut a lot of corners to make their art, and we in the West mistake that for stylistic decisions. They're not making stylistic decisions. A lot of it is bad habits that they create in order to get around the intense workload that they have to achieve in order to make just the barest of livings. Uh, so yeah, there. Danger. Another danger is learning others' bad habits and internalizing them as stylistic choices. And last but not least, if you're mixing styles all willy-nilly, you're you're not helping yourself. What you're doing is you're becoming an unfocused melange of other people, and instead of making conscious choices to help you tell the story. So these are the dangers. These are why master studies are often, or just copying the art that you love, that's a, that's a simpler, less pretentious way of saying it, uh, of copying the drawings that you love is because these dangers are huge and they're real and they can really, they, they can hobble you. They can make it so hard for you to grow because these are all the ways to do master studies wrong. There's the way, here's one way, the one way I'm aware of to do master studies correctly and this is the silver bullet that will help your master studies take you to the next level. Copy other people's cartoons with a specific goal in mind. 
there needs to be a very specific thing that you're trying to learn, trying to understand, and copying with that thing in mind. Because if you're copying just a copy, then what you're doing is just making marks on paper. You are not making art here. What you're doing is you are, you are making studying. Like how many mathematicians, when they go to publish their works, how many of them publish their high school homework? Uh, absolutely zero. So these master studies, these are going in my sketchbook, but none of these are going to be framed. None of these are going to be in an art book that I publish later. These are just studies. This is, you're looking at me doing my homework. The specifics that I'm trying to understand right here is I'm trying to open up myself to the idea of radically simplifying my drawings and doing it in a way that is effective, that still conveys the tone and the emotion, the emotional information that I want to convey. Learning how much detail is important, how much is necessary, and how much isn't. Learning exactly what is and is not important to me in terms of the detail that I include. And on top of that, the cartoon modern style is very highly, highly underrated for its mastery. It's unparalleled mastery in terms of A, composition, and B, the use of shape. Uh, because Cartoon Modern is all shapes. There's not a whole lot of depth in there. It's shapes, and the original early modern, uh, the early Cartoon Modern didn't use a whole lot of color because it had to be done in a hurry, it had to be done on a cheap, and the more color you have, the less hurry and the less cheap you can make it for. So it's almost all shape and composition, telling complex stories, fun, interesting, action-packed, uh, for instance, the case of Samurai Jack, incredible stories with incredible depth of emotion and incredible depths of information with as simple composition and as simple shapes as possible. And the, the real magic is in how they're arranged. So the specific that I'm after is learning restraint and learning how to have just laser-like precision in terms of my shapes and in terms of my compositions. So in order to do that, I am copying as faithfully as I possibly can without deviating. Now for you, something that you might want to study is, I wonder where I'm at stylistically. So you would copy, but you would make alterations. You would make small stylistic alterations in places that hopefully would come from yourself and not from some other master study, where you would discover, oh, you know what? I feel like spending more time on hands. That's something about me. Oh, you know what? I don't actually care about feet. I don't care about them that much, and I'm perfectly fine just using these wedges as feet. And then looking at the finished drawing later, much later, after you've forgotten about it and deciding, ah, I don't care about drawing feet, but you know what? It throws off the drawing, so I have to spend the time on that detail. Or, you know, I spent all this time focusing on all the little specifics of the facial expression and I didn't need that much. All I need are these lines here and now I feel liberated and now I know it because I did the master study to help me learn that. So that's the silver bullet. Copy with a goal. Copy with a specific thing or smart, short series of things that you're trying to learn and go out and learn those things. Do not make this art as finished artworks. This is homework. This is the homework that you've got to do because it makes you better. And that's the other thing that I personally as an artist have to conquer. Once you decide to take that leap to being a professional, you think anytime I click the pencil, what comes out the other end has to be used to make money because especially where I live in the world, man, if you need to be hustling constantly if you want this to be a living. And this is taking kind of a Buddhist approach. You know what? I'm going to take this time for me so that I can be better. And that's the other specific goal that I'm trying to learn with this study. And that's something that every artist needs. So I hope that, uh, I hope that this helps. So number one, master studies. Good thing. Copying the cartoons and the drawings of the artists that you like. Good idea. Do it. But do it with a specific goal in mind and do it with the understanding that just taking this time to learn and get better is valuable in and of itself. You're not wasting time, you're cultivating yourself. And that's the most important thing in art, in, in your life as an artist. That growth is extremely important and you're allowed to accept just that growth as your reward. So there you go. Uh, I hope this helped. Thank you so much for listening. Take care of yourself. Take care of your friends and make art.